Season 3 of Dallas saw a slew of suspects lining up to get a piece of good old J.R. Ewing, including, but not limited to, his tortured wife Sue Ellen, his noble brother Bobby, cuckolded Ray Krebs, his mistress Kristen, his longtime rival Cliff Barnes, his lackey Alan Beam, Alan, Alan Beam. the half dozen business associates he screwed out of millions, Marilee Stone, the widow of one of those associates, his mistress Kristen, Kristen's boyfriend Rudy, who J.R. got fired, the ghost of Sue Ellen's paramour Dusty Farlow, who died in a plane crash, Jeb Ames and Willie Joe Gar, his mistress Kristen, both of his parents, honestly, his brother Gary, Gary's daughter Lucy, Gary's wife Valene, his mistress Kristen, and the guy who does the voice for Optimus Prime. J.R. must be stopped. No matter the cost. They all had a motive, but only one of them could do it. And now we find out who and why. Uh We pick up where we left off last time, with Sue Ellen Ewing being booked for attempted murder in the shooting of J.R., She stumbles through it, zombie-like, talking way too much to the cops before her lawyer arrives. Is there anything you would like to explain to me before your lawyer arrives? Sue Ellen, am I being detained? I want to talk to my lawyer. As you'll recall, Sue Ellen was blackout drunk, but she had JR's gun in her purse, and it had been fired twice. That, admittedly, is pretty damning. Sue Ellen's lawyer finally arrives and tells her not to talk. Look at how salty the cop is when he can't grill Sue Ellen anymore. Her lawyer tells her that she'll have to stay overnight, which frightens the dainty Sue Ellen like she has tickets to see Mr. Burt Reynolds. The whole thing leaves the family puzzled, but Jock is adamant that no one, including any well-coiffed do-gooder sons, will be helping Sue Ellen post bail. For my dead body, Kyle, do you understand? Even Ellie forbids Bobby from posting bail. In a pivotal character-building scene when taken in the larger context of the character, Kyle Bennett, Sue Ellen's lawyer, asks Sue Ellen if she has $100,000 in her name to post bail, and she has to admit that she has nothing to her name. Worse yet, when he asks her to think of anyone who could help her, she also has to admit that there is no one. She has no one to help her. The realization that a grown woman has so thoroughly dedicated herself to her husband in exchange for security, fame, and fortune only to realize that he can take it away from her at any point, and because she has no foundation or investment in herself, she is helpless is one of the most devastating points the show ever made. Cliff is shocked to see the headlines that Wife has been charged with shooting JR. Jeez, do they have to position her as nothing but JR's wife? You have to erase all of her accomplishments? You're telling me that former Miss Texas shoots oil tycoon isn't gonna sell more papers? Cliff shows up to be Sue Ellen's hero, in case you thought things couldn't get any worse for her. Don't let him help Sue Ellen, he'll probably get you charged with the Kennedy assassination. He does promise to get the money somewhere to bail her out. Meanwhile, Bobby secures purchase of an oil refinery for Ewing Oil, something that Jock and JR have been desperate for since at least season two, but they've been unable to pull off. Took Bobby three episodes, so maybe you do catch more flies with honey. Unfortunately, the bank refuses to do business with Bobby, what with all the chaos in the family Ewing right now. Out of nowhere, Sue Ellen's bail gets posted and she's free to go. The only problem is, she's got nowhere else to go. I got nowhere else to go! At this point, I have to mention the spectacular Hitchcockian use of clothing on Sue Ellen, which is black and white. Is she good? Is she bad? Is she guilty? Is she innocent? We don't know, and the dress sure isn't telling us anything other than there's a question there. Lucy catches up with Mitch on campus and charms her way into forgiveness, but like, How could you not forgive her? Look at that face! Mitch admits to feeling pressured all the time, and his stubborn pride nearly makes him turn down a new set of apology books from Lucy. You know, for the price of the college textbooks, Lucy probably could have posted Sue Ellen's bail twice over. Sue Ellen assumes that Cliff posted bail, so she thanks him. To his credit, Cliff admits to having no credit, or at least not enough to raise that kind of scratch. Sue Ellen is in the middle of a breakdown, though, and while Linda Gray is an amazing actress, Sue Ellen is not. So her high-pitched, I'm fine, is a great performance from Gray. In a kinda sweet, kinda clueless moment, Jock tells Ray he's worried about the impact all this is having on Miss Ellie. He doesn't really seem to care about the pain that Gary, Bobby, JR, or Sue Ellen are going through. 
just what it'll do to Miss Ellie. In a drop-in scene planted for later, Cliff Barnes meets with Dave Culver, son of the late Sam Culver. Donna Culver is also there, and it's weird hearing grown man Dave refer to Donna as his stepmother. You know Cliff Barnes, my stepmother, Donna Culver? I mean, the weird thing was her being married to Sam in the first place, but hearing it out loud... Anyway, Donna is sneakily protective of Dave when she sees Cliff slithering about him. Cliff hits on Donna on her way out, and the one thing I've always appreciated about the character of Donna Culver is that she has Lucy Ewing's insight into people's hearts and motives. The difference, though, and this is what makes Donna such a unique and inviting character in the Dallas canon, is that she's so calculating that she accepts people, warts and all. Unlike Pamela, who puts both Bobby and Mark Grayson on pedestals, and Sue Ellen, who diminishes herself so much that she crawls back to Cliff, Dusty, and JR multiple times, sometimes literally, Donna goes in with clear eyes, and while it does occasionally get to be too much for her, she never gets to the point where she demonstrates the philosophy, well, if I just love him enough and I give him more of myself, he'll learn to love me. Donna Culver has healthy limits. While the mystery of who shot JR may be winding down, we get another mystery. Who put up Sue Ellen's bail? We know Sue didn't do it. We know the Shepherds couldn't do it. We know that Cliff didn't do it. And now all the Ewings are denying it as well. JR, if I'd have done something, I'd have told you about it. Sue Ellen arrives at Kristen's apartment and throws herself on her sister's mercy, asking for a place to stay for a few days. She also throws herself on Bobby's mercy. You remember, Bobby? The man who told her at the end of season three that he'd never let JR do anything bad to her? Now JR has enough ammunition to put me away for good. I'll stop him. And you're not going to put me back into that sanitarium. Who's gonna stop me? Bobby's gonna stop you. She asks him to help her see her own son, to which Bobby responds with another lukewarm promise and tells her he's late for a meeting. This is the virtuous brother, remember. Cliff runs into Donna, who tells him to stay away from Dave's campaign. Ha! I knew it! From the moment she saw him, she was like a veteran actress at Miramax, and Dave Culver was like the latest ingenue. She rightly tells Cliff that he destroyed his own career, and she's invested too much in making Dave a rising star, that she's not going to let Cliff put Dave in a tank with a stupid helmet and let him parade around for a campaign ad. And she's not going to let Dave be weaponized against the Ewings. Damn. Donna did everything but pull out the three of clubs and ask him if that was his card. Cliff has to admit that he hates his job and he wants back into politics even if it means being Dave's number two instead of having his own Senate seat. Any pain that JR feels along the way would just be a bonus, not the end goal. See, that's the difference with savvy Donna Culver and the other women on this show. Her being five steps ahead of Cliff's bullshit has forced him to be honest with her. And even though he's a loser weasel, she makes the calculation that she can accept him on those terms and the two go to lunch to discuss the future. In fairness, it also does help that she has all the power in the relationship. She's like Bizarro Sue Ellen. Speaking of Sue Ellen, she doesn't believe that she could have shot JR, but all the physical evidence points to her having done so. Nice of JR not to cancel her LB appointments, by the way, which seems like a minor plot hole, but actually has some neat subtextual explanation in the following scene. JR meets with Kyle Bennett of Bennett and Smithfield to ask him about the things Sue Ellen said in her meetings with him. Bennett says he'll never betray a client's trust, but he folds pretty quickly when JR threatens to find other lawyers. It is at this point when Kyle Bennett Superstar oil, gas, and criminal law expert Esquire realizes that maybe representing an accused shooter when the victim has the entire law firm on retainer could be a conflict of interest? Why is every lawyer on this show the worst lawyer who ever lived? JR's gleeful aside to the camera when he all but threatens to root out Sue Ellen's conversations with her new lawyer is a nice welcome back for Hagman. See, this is what the first three episodes of this season were missing. Anywho, this helps explain why JR might still keep Sue Ellen's appointments, hoping that she'd spill something to Elby that he could use later. On the child abuse we all suffered through but repressed front, John Ross now has the Molly Ringwald starter kit haircut. I also had said haircut. And so did the kid from The Shining. I swear, satanic panic was just a smokescreen to cover up this mass psychic trauma. To hell with Pizzagate. Why doesn't someone look into Bullgate? You can start with this guy. Bobby relays the message that Sue Ellen wants to see her son. Jock and JR strenuously object. After all, Sue Ellen might get blackout drunk again and shoot the baby for no reason. Miss Ellie says that she and Pam will meet Sue Ellen in a public park to let her see the baby. It's weird that Ellie describes it like it's a drug deal. Well, maybe not. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one. It's the Ten Crack Commandment. Bubby has to pass up the opportunity at buying the refinery because the bank is so chicken-hearted. Come on, ignore the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933 and undercapitalize your bank by handing out a risky loan. What do you honestly think is going to happen? There has been a widespread loss of confidence, and major sectors of America's financial system are at risk of shutting down. At the park, Stone Cold serial killer Sue Ellen Ewing plays with her son. God, she's more animal than woman. Both Pam and Ellie find it hard to believe that Sue Ellen did it, despite the missing time window and the physical evidence. Finally, Sue Ellen relents and lets Dr. Elby put her under hypnosis, the go-to plot device for all hacky mysteries. Yes, I'm looking at you too, Spellbound. This leads to the flashback sequence we've all been waiting for. Sue Ellen finds the gun in the bedroom. She tells Elby that JR has to be stopped. She has a drink to steal herself and then tries to call the office. She storms over to Kristen's to try to catch JR in the act, but Kristen just gives her more liquor. She does threaten to kill JR when she finds him, but she mutters something about Dusty and then wanders off. More drinking ensued, and it just goes to prove something my great uncle always used to say. Hypnosis is no match for vodka. She does remember everything that happened after the airport, though, and that's wherein the mystery is solved. The gun was hidden in the closet, but Sue Ellen was sober when she arrived home and she didn't have the gun. That only leaves one person, thus filling in Benoit Blanc's donut hole. I know you're not evil! I believe in you! Sue Ellen storms over to the ranch, frightening JR half to death, but she's just there to accuse Kristen of attempted murder. We get a reframed flashback of Sue Ellen going to Kristen's. In this version, Sue Ellen sets the gun down on the table to accept the drink, rather than holding her drink, purse, and gun at the same time, like we saw in the original flashback. Well, that's just cheating. Kristen does indeed shoot JR, and then we see her hiding the gun in the closet while Sue Ellen is in the shower. Kristen admits to the crime, but then she lays down the trump card. I wouldn't do that if I were you, JR. Not unless you want your child born in prison. And we're out. Ah, there we go. There's the sweet, soapy mystery nonsense I wanted out of this storyline. No more spinning of the wheels. Of course, this brings to a close one of the most famous mysteries in television history, and it was watched by one third of the country. In fact, it was the biggest single episode in history for a year until the MASH finale surpassed it. You couldn't escape it. You had JR bumper stickers, you had JR merchandise, you had JR beer. I mean, everywhere you went, there was Dallas. As far as suspects go, Kristen's as good as any for the role. She had a rock solid motive, she was always vindictive enough, and she needed to be written out anyway to make way for the freshman crop of JR underlings. I appreciate the reveal too, and that the whole hypnotism thing was just a misdirect. The key to unlocking the mystery came after Sue Ellen sobered up, and was there the whole time. Although, not for the audience, who clearly saw Sue Ellen drink with the gun and leave with the gun when Kristen told the story. That version of events ruled Kristen out because she never got her hands on that gun. That's fine if you're okay with misdirecting Sue Ellen, but it also misdirects the audience, so we really have no chance of engaging in the mystery. It's not like Ryan Johnson's mysteries, where the key to solving the crime is recontextualizing the information you already have. A case with a hole in the middle. A donut. This is just straight up lying to the audience. But you saw how drunk I was, and you still gave me a drink. No one I'd put the gun down to take it. I'm not mad about it, mind you. It would just be nice to play along at home, that's all. What I like most about this episode is that it sets up many future storylines organically, unlike the clunky way they did it in the previous few episodes. Sue Ellen has a mysterious benefactor. That's a mystery that naturally spins off from this one. Cliff and Donna form an alliance as a natural progression from Cliff getting disillusioned at his job because of the JR situation. Oh, and Bobby barely had any scenes with Pam which is a nice bit of show don't tell as he slouches toward Babylon. It feels like we're finally getting ready to jumpstart the season, so buckle up. End the flight, please. Market. 